there might be approximately one and a half to 1.6 million uh, folks with over a million dollars of investable surpluses. And the collective uh, assets under management of these guys is likely to be in the range of two to two and a half trillion dollars. I would be like, you are a, such a successful consultant, a CXO. How has your portfolio got to this point? How did you think about getting that first set of users? And especially given this is a trust business. Personally, my time, I think 70 to 80% of the time then and now still goes into hiring. But we certainly have used, let's say, the digital watering holes like LinkedIn to create uh, a strong presence for ourselves. The fact that people were thinking of us and coming back on their own to top up was the first indicator for me that, okay, we are on to something here. Hello and welcome to the day one series of podcasts. In these podcasts, uh, we chronicle the journeys of early stage founders and companies that we partner with. Today, we have with us Sandeep Jethwani, who is the co-founder of Deserve. Deserve is a house of investment solutions targeted at the affluent Indian. We'll unpack this a little bit more during the course of this conversation. Uh, but what Deserve essentially does is to bring together two things uh, to make this work for the end user, which is expertise of seasoned professionals and two, advanced tech and data science. Awesome, Sandeep. I'm so excited to have you here. Uh, you've been one of the most requested guests on this series of podcasts and also you bring with yourself two decades of experience in the wealth, fintech and in institution building. So I thought today we'll unpack a little bit of this industry, what we are building at Deserve and also a bunch of learnings for early stage founders in the space. So excited to have you. Thank you, Vas. Thanks for having me. Uh, we've been following the day one podcast for a while now. So it's a lot of learning for uh, founders like me. Um, and like I said, you don't uh, miss an opportunity to remind me of my age. Uh, so this is helpful. Good. No, so I'll, I'll pick on that thread itself. See, one of the questions um, we get asked a lot is when you want to disrupt a space, is it better to be an insider with deep experience or are you better off bringing a fresh pair of eyes? And wealth is a space you've understood for a long time, been in it for two decades, as I said, uh, from what I understand, managed about 50,000 crores of capital in your previous avatar uh, along with your co-founders. So what's been some of those? Like, where has it helped? Where has it been a handicap? How have you proactively solved for that? So, Vas, I think uh, on balance, it's been a big positive for us. But I'll give you the pros and cons of us having been from this space. The pros were broadly around two areas. The first was that we operate in a highly regulated space. Uh, we manage other people's money. And therefore, being uh, very aware of what we can do, what we can offer, how we can present the offering, uh, all of that has to be within the regulated ambit. Uh, and we do see a lot of uh, like things which are happening at the margin now and which are concerning. And obviously, the regulator acts up every once in a while around those. The second area was that the core consumer insight about how people think about money hasn't changed uh, forever probably and it also hasn't changed across uh, sort of AUM segments. So how do the super wealthy think uh, versus how uh, let's say the affluent think uh, there aren't that many changes or differences in uh, how people perceive money, how people think about uh, the volatility and the risks etc. So those are things that were two big positives uh, when we came in. Now, what are the downsides or what are the cons? I think the, uh, one of the uh, important things was we were operating in a digital first environment for the very first time. Now, the difference between a digital first environment and what we were doing earlier is that in every conversation with the user, we would be around. We would be talking to the client and walking them through. So that reaction and feedback loops were very fast. Whereas in the digital uh, space, that the feedback loops aren't as fast. Uh, and learning that, figuring out that some of this genuinely does take time and we need to be patient with it were probably some of the things that we had to sort of figure out as we went. But on balance, I think uh, the first two really helped. Uh, and overall, it translated into significant uh, early AUM momentum. Uh, now, in our business, uh, the North Star metric uh, is assets under management. And the quicker you get off the ground there, uh, it's helpful for the business. So in a sense, it solves for the cold start problem. 
uh, which I think uh, we were able to do only because we came from the industry. No, see, in Bangon, when we look at, let's say, the 100 plus odd billion dollar valued companies in India, you and you look at their founding teams, you actually see a very healthy mix of people who are new to the industry and people who come in with experience. And then as long as you come in with eyes open and you say these are certain um, baggage I come with, for the lack of a better word, and you solve for it proactively, I think it, it works out quite well. Uh, and let's get a little bit into the wealth industry. It feels like a daunting term from outside. Just uh, talk to us a little bit about this industry. What are trends? What are trades? How has this evolved? What are things somebody outside wouldn't know? So, uh, Vas, wealth is a very broad uh, space, right? And at some level, everyone is in the wealth management business, starting from banks, uh, the like them asking you for your current and savings account money is also a way of wealth management, right? Um, so are brokerages and so on. Now, if you look at this industry, it broadly breaks down into two categories. The first is what we call transactional players, where the client knows what they want to do and transactional players solve for cost and access, right? Uh, and the second is the managed uh, solutions players, where the client is saying that I want somebody to solve a problem for me uh, and that problem might be that I don't have the time, bandwidth or inclination to manage my portfolio myself. The problem can be a goal that they want to achieve. Uh, so the managed solution space solves for this. Now, uh, and you'll almost see a clean breakup across these two categories when you think about uh, the traditional wealth industry also. Historically also, there have been uh, strong offline brokerages and uh, there have been large traditional wealth managers which deal with clients offline but they solve a certain problem uh, and this also maps into how you clients think about their money uh, more often than not there are clients who have a certain approach to how they deal with their investments there are some clients who want the thrill or the engagement of actually figuring out where they want to deploy their own money right and we typically find that in the early stage of your life when the capital amounts are smaller, you have more uh, ability to experiment, you have less dependencies on you, uh, you are more in the transactional ecosystem. And as you get wealthier over time, you migrate towards the uh, managed solutions ecosystem because the quantum of money that you're managing becomes larger, the stakes are bigger, uh, the, uh, the uh, costs of getting it wrong are much higher from a family impact perspective, etc. So this is a traditional sort of a uh, uh, thing that you see across our industry that people start with being or working with transactional players and then graduate to working with uh, solutions providers. No, makes sense. And that also leads me back to our early conversations when you guys were just starting up and when we decided to partner. Uh, could you bring to life some of those insights which made you say, let's take a plunge here and build something out? What were some of those consumer insights you had at that time. So before I get to consumer insights, Vast, let's think about the market situation in itself, right? Traditionally, what has happened is that uh, this dichotomy of transactional uh, service providers and solutions providers has always existed in the wealth industry in India and globally, right? Uh, now, however, what had happened was that we had seen digital first players come in and capture the transactional space. So today, uh, arguably, the digital players will have anywhere between 65 to 70% market share in terms of the transactional. So if you look at the likes of Grow, Zerodha, and some of the others, they have significant market share. And that's almost changed over the last uh, 10 to 12 years. If you go back 10 years ago, this wasn't the case. The offline guys were dominating this particular segment. But this had not played out in the managed solutions uh, space. And why was this? The market was such that wealth creation was happening only at the top. There were barely 25 to 30,000 families. Uh, if I look back, let's say 15, 20 years ago, when uh, I got into wealth management, who had the money to be able to deal with a wealth manager, right? Now, that construct was fundamentally shifting, courtesy of more bonuses, um, ESOPs, wealth creation happening, MNC setting up in India, and so on and so forth. So, in general, uh, we were seeing a whole new market open up which hadn't existed in the past. For example, today, as we look ahead, we think about the fact that there might be 
approximately one and a half to 1.6 million uh, folks with over a million dollars of investable surpluses. And the collective uh, assets under management of these guys is likely to be in the range of two to two and a half trillion dollars, right? Now, this segment did not exist in this size, right? As a result of which, most of the players were comfortable delivering offline engagements to uh, these clients, the limited set that was there. Now, as the segment grew, the wealth management industry was not able to keep pace with it. So, at the very first instance, we were seeing that the number of potential clients who have investable surplus relative to the service providers uh, had increased dramatically. So, service providers had not kept pace with the number of clients which were out there. Uh, so that was one. Having said that, there was this fundamental issue that how do you trust a digital brand to give significant sums of money? And I think COVID was a big inflection point in this behavior, where suddenly people were forced into a situation where they were dealing digitally, right? So uh, if you look at if you look back, let's say a few years ago, if you wanted to send five lakhs or ten lakhs to somebody, you would write out a check. Today, if somebody asks you to write out a check, most of our clients don't even know where the checkbooks are, right? So that is a fundamental shift that happened over the last few years that allows players like us to exist today. So that was, I think, the market uh, construct in which this was happening. As far as the consumer insight goes, I think going back to what I was saying earlier, that when you have more money and you have more demands on the money, you have kids growing up, uh, you want to buy a bigger house, uh, you want to travel abroad, etc. The What you expect from this money increases and the risk of getting it wrong is very, very high. So there was an inherent anxiety that people had uh, about if their portfolios are being managed well or not. Uh, and this was the first time uh, it sort of got accentuated during COVID. So what was happening is uh, this was mid-2020. I was getting a lot of calls from my batchmates from I'm Bangalore and saying that, why don't you have a look at my portfolio? And they would send me their portfolio. And I would be like, you are a, such a successful consultant or CXO. How has your portfolio got to this point? Like how, how did you mismanage it to this level? And then is when I realized that they were concerned about uh, how their portfolio was performing and they did not have the right uh, advice. Uh, and that sort of almost like drove us into a decision that we should solve for this ourselves, for people like us. No, and it's actually quite insane how that consumer insight has held out well and we've sort of built on that same ethos. And today, if I describe us and, you know, it's it's quite a mouthful. I was trying to remember to say this correct. We're building the largest, um, let me redo this. We're building the largest house of investment solutions for affluent Indians. Yeah. It's a loaded <clears throat> term. Unpack <throat> this term for us. So, yeah, it's uh, something that we've come to uh, describe ourselves as over the last couple of uh, years. It's, it's, it's not something as clear uh, when we started when we first spoke to you. But let's, let's break it up into three parts, right? Let's take the affluent Indian segment first. Who are affluent Indians? Uh, typically, anyone with more than a crore of investable surplus falls in the... Uh, uh, you know, the absolute 0.1 to 0.2 percent of India. And that's the segment that we are solving for. Uh, this particular segment has grown in different ways, uh, courtesy of uh, GST and to some extent Demon, a uh, formalization of economy happened. Uh, so a lot of SME folks joined this particular category, which earlier were investing into, let's say, gold or real estate. The second and to our mind, the biggest category that has opened up within this is the uh, senior working professional. Uh, salary uh, brackets have changed uh, very dramatically. Uh, wealth creation is happening through ownership of equity. Um, so I think that is the second. And the third is the Indian diaspora, where uh, Indians who are uh, living abroad doing really well are sending money back to India. And they want to be a part in some sense of the India growth story. They want to keep an option of returning back to uh, home base at some point of time, right? So that's the affluent Indian uh, category. In terms of the house of investment solutions, right? The Like I said, what, what is Deserve really trying to do? We are trying to solve problems that people have with their money, uh, what they expect from their money and how this will get deployed 
if this is let's say growth capital or steady return and so on so we create investment solutions which span public markets private equity uh, structured credit uh, global assets we provide solutions to non resident indians looking to invest back into india so we are essentially creating these solutions where an expert team at deserve is owning and running the portfolio as opposed to me coming back to you on a daily basis and saying that buy this particular stock or bond or mutual fund and leaving that entire cognitive load on to the client we don't do that we take the responsibility we deliver performance and uh, in in large part of our business we get compensated as a result of that performance mm -hmm. which is we operate on a only a share of profit model and the the third part which to my mind is the most uh, important is the trusted bit uh, any financial services player needs to make trust their core ethos like delivering to the trust and this requires us living it on a daily basis with every decision that we are taking along the way for example how we communicate uh, to potential clients or uh, how we review their existing portfolios through wealth monitor or what we do with their money how do we make money how do we engage with regulators all of that has to amplify trust uh and which is why it's sort of like an internal guiding mission also that we have to make sure that we end up as being the most trusted in this particular category the opportunity is that if you think about affluent india and think of one brand which you associate as being trusted by these folks i think that's a wide space uh so it's that's exciting for us see and that today feels very crystal clear but i also remember this journey of us getting to this clarity to say what exactly are we building and to really articulate it in one line mm -hmm. maybe describe that journey for us how did this happen and actually a related question is you know it's very obvious on day one you never have this sort of an absolute clarity on exactly what the product and what the mission is mm -hmm. um at what point do you say this is good enough for me to start yeah i think <clears throat> in general it's never good enough but i'll um, tell you uh, how so what was the fundamental consumer insight which we referred to was that we believe that people are concerned about are their portfolios keeping up uh, and uh, whether they are performing the way they expect them to perform and if uh, there is somebody who can do it better how can they trust that service provider to handle it better for them for us going in the thing was let's solve for uh the visualization of how your portfolio is currently doing uh which was a very big challenge for most uh, users a lot of our clients are people who've dealt with multiple different banks let's say you were in a salaried job at one place you opened a salary bank account there made some investments via that rm then you moved to another company and a new bank account got opened and suddenly a new rm was dealing with you and so on so you had money spread across a bunch of places you don't know whether that is performing in line with the market underperforming outperforming there's a lot of party conversation about how somebody else's portfolio is doing better so we said let's solve for this particular thing first uh and we sort of gave multiple attempts at it the initial ones didn't quite work the way uh we visualized it so we actually didn't launch a large part of uh, what we had worked on but this finally ended up becoming what we now call wealth monitor where essentially uh, using a seamless process we import uh, the existing portfolio using a consent layer so we take the client's consent on uh, pulling their current portfolio information from multiple sources and then are able to show them clearly how the portfolio is doing for a lot of people this is the first time where they are actually seeing a performance of a comprehensive portfolio mm -hmm. uh and it, that's like an aha moment that oh a i did not know i had say 39 mutual funds in my portfolio i did not know that at least 15 of them are not even performing in line with the index and i'm paying a certain amount of cost uh we help people visualize it by laying out a concept called missed gains which is how would you have done if you had invested only in the index versus investing in these active funds uh and so on so forth so some of that uh, has now become sort of like a way for us 
helping clients deal with us even before they start making their first investment with us uh so that was the first part of the solve and the second part was uh we were clear that we will always be a solution provider we will not load the client with all the decisions of figuring out which fund etc so we started creating portfolios around how we would manage money both on the pms side our portfolio management service as well as on the mutual fund side unlike other wealth managers we don't tell you which specific fund to buy we ask you for your objectives we have certain portfolios built around those objectives and then we run them so these were the broad two things that we ended up uh, solving for no see and in dun you also we speak a lot about those initial design choices and what struck us even when we met you initially was some of those early design choices you were making on how the portfolio review would happen how we would take a solution approach and that from there starts to evolve but i think your initial set of design choices has to be very bottom up very consumer driven market driven so that was always amazing to see uh and you know one of the things there is that you make a lot of mistakes along the way right we in fact uh, uh came up with this concept of portfolio score i remember that so this morning before the podcast i was actually opening up our first memo yeah. and i saw some screenshots of this portfolio score and uh, it was a nice walk down memory lane exactly and even i and i think about how like how silly it was like in a sense because uh the what would a uh, additional number do to a uh, user's life mm-hmm. right like so some of that got us to question and constantly figure out whether are we on the right track uh, uh, so the moment we showed some of those feedbacks to let's say even family members or the, those screens to family members for feedback uh, they would not along like uh, and i later found out the concept of the mom's test Uh, uh that you shouldn't ask your immediate family for feedback because nobody said anything but nobody showed any excitement right and that was very clear going in that that model won't work and we would have to figure out a new approach uh, around that so yeah a lot of uh, mistakes along the way was i'm actually curious like at since you mentioned the early times and what was it that you sort of saw in uh deserve or the concept uh that led you to making an investment yeah see i think the white space was always evident to us which is to say there is one this rising affluence um for them there is a white space of what wealth solutions are possible there's either this white glove uh, service which doesn't work or works for a certain affluence level or there is a bunch of these transactions or diy solutions which maybe works for a small part of your net worth but not entirely so this white space was starting to become more and more apparent to us one just anecdotally as we looked around and a lot of people in our social circles and the numbers also started to come in terms of affluence and what not those pyramids started to get wider at the top um so that was always apparent to us then when we met the three of you i think two three things struck us one was how you guys understood the space very customer first very bottoms up um and that reflected in the design choices i was talking about wherein there were some things you were clear that we will do solutions only our reviews will work a certain way and obviously we figure out the exact notions of that but those design choices really resonated with us and third see running a wealth business uh, especially for this tg is a fairly complex business to run like it requires a lot of things to come together that's where again we thought the three of you uh, brought uh, very complementary skills to the table um across investing client experience uh product bunch of those other things which is needed so that sort of came to got together for us no very interesting i i remember the first time we actually flew down during covid to uh, meet you guys and we were like all masked up and yeah. in uh, I mean, hazmat suits meeting in office uh, yeah. after covid and in fact you know i think the round could have happened online but i sort of insisted that you know we should meet because it seemed like we are getting into a very long term journey together and uh, without like meeting and given how old again we are that we just couldn't get ourselves to uh, getting on a long term partner uh, online right so yeah so no makes sense and let me turn this around uh, what made you choose us as your partner and maybe also broaden it out to say for early stage founders who are looking to uh, get the right vc partners along what advice would you have um so uh, a lot of things actually came together uh, was so let me talk about 
how we perceived elevation before we met you guys right uh, and what happened once we met you uh, before we met you guys there was one that you guys are investors in some very large outcomes um, and have partnered those companies through a lot of thick and thin right uh, today some of the largest companies uh, that you folks are investors in let's say paytm or swiggy etc didn't never had linear journeys right uh, and to that extent it was very reassuring that uh, you have seen uh, and as a sort of older founder you know that going into the business there will be lots of volatility sometimes because of the company sometimes because of external environment so that cred really stood out for us the second uh, was that when we spoke to other founders uh, the founder nps seemed very high and very few people were able to articulate what they liked but they kept saying that elevation folks are nice guys right uh, and i think it meant different things for different people but the uh, net substance of that was that the nps was very positive so that made sure that we should uh, talk to elevation and then we were introduced by a common friend and when we met you guys that sort of got solidified that it seemed like it was very first principles down to earth kind of an approach to uh, thinking about the problem a lot of the initial discussions were less pitches but also to some extent conversations around okay what if we were to do this differently and how would how are you thinking about this so in a sense it didn't feel like us like doing a, a sort of a pitch to you versus it seemed more like a discussion uh, and i think that really helped give us the comfort that uh, this can be a long term partnership that we can embark on uh i think the other thing which towards the end of the when we were putting together the round i think you guys also helped think through the right partners uh the round construct the kind of angels we should bring on board the kind of advisors mentors we should bring on board which i think also like even before the money was wired sort of created that comfort that we have now a partner to discuss things with so yeah so i think some of those things uh, really worked out for us and i think each one of those things has played out over the last 3 years of uh, the partnership uh, in terms of other founders honestly everyone has their own unique journeys but uh, what i would like think today is that we shouldn't founder shouldn't think about this as a as a pitch because at the end of the day this is a partnership that you are entering into sometimes uh, courtesy of a lot of social media and to some extent shark tank it seems like this needs to be like this high powered pitch where you are coming in and saying all the right things and then people will make a decision in 5 minutes uh, honestly investment conversations and certainly uh, private equity or venture capital investment conversations are not and should not be like that right it's a very long term thinking that you have to and from that that perspective the conversations with uh, investors should be more uh, discussions as opposed to pitches no makes sense i and just to reflect back on the conversations i think i remember the session we had on gtm and it's also sometimes funny to think back of what we thought to what we are doing today but it's always uh, fun to have those chats and I remember this whole concept of watering hole you introduced to us and then it was this long chat on what are the different watering holes you could go to and yeah. uh, it's a term i have picked up i started using it a lot these days finally enough uh, finally after all of these years now it's beginning to make sense the concept of watering hole which is like the the right areas that where we should be present to be able to attract the clients that we want to go after uh, the concept has remained but the way it manifested has changed so we had thought that we'll work with corporates and go on and try and market our solutions there that's something we haven't done but we certainly have used let's say the digital watering holes like linkedin to create uh, a strong presence for ourselves so yeah i think uh, some of these things evolve and in hindsight a lot of things are like what were we thinking like industry fundraising a little bit longer sandeep is 
you know, when I speak to a lot of founders, it's not the most enjoyable part of being a founder or a CEO. It is one of those necessary evils you need to do. How has that experience been for you? What have you liked? What have you disliked? Yeah, I think uh, it's an interesting question. And look, I think at one level, Avas, we've always been fundraising uh, because we come from a space where we were trying to manage money for people, right? So we're always like presenting options and uh, getting in money. Sometimes we were raising money for other venture funds. We were raising money for other companies, etc. The difference this time around is that we were raising money for ourselves. Uh, the hardest part about fundraising is the fact that you are giving up a part of the company, right? And it's not only about the fact that you're getting diluted or uh, uh, that you own lesser as a percentage of the company than you did before the round happened but more the thing that you feel like a part of the company now belongs to somebody else uh, and that is the hard part as a but that's a necessary requirement to run a business right you need capital and at the point at which you embrace that and say that this will be uh, this is good for the company in the long run i think that mental mindset made a big difference the moment you think about okay this will be good for the company in the long term you think about what will work uh, in uh, in the favor of the company for example what is the right type of partner will i be able to work with this partner over the next 5 10 15 years right so i think that has been a process for us it uh, in the very early days uh, the conversations were positive but going into any new round it's almost like this overwhelming sense of uh, doom that, oh my God, I have to get in this process all over again and do it. And now it's been a couple of times. So uh, I wouldn't say it's enjoyable. It is, uh, but it's something that we now embrace with a much higher degree of positivity. In terms of the tactical things there, I think one thing that's really helped us is that we now put together, uh, let's say going in a list of uh, the people that we want to partner with, right? Uh, we would put together a list of, let's say, 10 or 15 funds that we want to speak or meet to. Even within those funds, we would put together the right partner who is familiar with this territory, but also uh, has good NPS. So that's the second thing. Uh, and the third thing is, is there fitment with the kind of money that we are trying to raise and the ownership that we'll give up for that with the fund's own strategy? Right? I think this part of this tactical understanding, a lot of founders, because probably they don't come from the investing ecosystem, they don't have. And that makes sure that your uh, discussions are uh, much more productive. If I don't put this framework together, you have a situation where you're presenting stroke meeting a lot of people who may not be appropriate. And that then seems like a whole energy drain uh, altogether. Right, So I think Tactically, I think founders should put together a list of uh, the funds that they want to work with uh, within them, which partner and whether the amount of money and ownership matches up to the fund's own strategy. The great thing a lot of funds are doing is now laying that out in the open and it's also evidence of it from the kind of investments that they've made. No, makes sense. I think good to be very intentional about this whole process rather than go with the flow. The other thing I keep hearing about is it's also forcing function for you to step back and take a slightly more long term view of the company also take stock of what are things today. Do we truly have PMF? Do our channels truly scale? Where does this company go five, seven years from now? Do you agree with that? Does that resonate? Absolutely. I think uh, see any external discussion is uh, actually gives you room for introspection. Like you figure out whether uh, you are in the right place. Going into the fundraise, uh, you know, when you look at your numbers, which you do even otherwise, but the fundraise process allows you or forces you to step back, like you said. When you're looking at it from a high level perspective, suddenly you begin to question some of the decisions that you've made and you will make uh, in the past. So I'll give you uh, an example. Like in the early days, the uh, thing was that we will launch a whole set of solutions all almost at the same time right uh, when we 
got into the our series a fundraise we realized that a certain set of solutions is doing really well for us uh and then we have this whole long tail which uh, probably the customers are not caring enough for right so why are we running them on sort of maintenance mode and we that allowed us to uh, almost like close off some of those things over a period of time now this thing to my mind wouldn't have happened if we were not doing this stepping back uh, and now it's also become a company thing where every few months we take a step back and see whether uh, outside of the fundraise but some of those things really helped us become sharper more focused the other thing is also it helps the company in a way that your storytelling and i don't mean it in a bad way gets better even internally so for example if let's say uh, i'm communicating a pitch to the investors and i've worked with you specifically on our pitches in the past i think as it gets sharper and we narrate that same story internally the vision and the alignment becomes tighter so i think in that sense the fundraise process has significant business and cultural benefits also no oh, makes sense and i think once some of this gets a little crystallized i feel just even repeating it making sure a line really helps i remember how you start all our board meetings with that what line we spoke about and just to get everybody aligned to say this is the big north star we're working on um sounds good so i think the we've spoken a little bit about the early part of the journey fundraise etc so now when you start building the product and you started putting it in the hands of the users at that stage what were north stars for you what were you tracking to say this works so actually uh, we had two sets of products almost at the same time uh, one was the investment solutions in themselves and the second was uh, the wealth monitor where the portfolio review was happening uh the wealth monitor honestly like the going in the thing was that how much of assets under tracking are we able to bring on to the platform uh because assets under tracking is a function of multiple things first is am i able to communicate the value prop to uh, users bef- uh, before they sign up uh second am i able to cover all of their assets or large enough part of their portfolio and their family's portfolio and third is am i able to deliver insights to them which will cause them to come back and use wealth monitor again because if they don't use and they fall off the assets under tracking also goes down so uh, wealth monitor was built to sort of solve for all of these like the narrative that we lay out when we communicate the value prop to what they see to the ease of uh, importing the portfolio to the insights that we show them right so these were the three broad buckets today wealth monitor is nearly about 50000 crores in assets under tracking and we are adding close to anywhere between 7 to 8000 crores on a monthly basis so that's clearly proven for us at least that there is value in it for the user the second bit was that having seen some of the insights that we offer them are we able to solve for some of the problems that they are seeing in their portfolio the core part of majority of portfolios and actually this was neglected by i'd say most of our industry for reasons of uh, economics not being so great is the core mutual fund part of client portfolios the common assumption in our industry was that <clears throat> mutual funds don't require active management right and if that were the case wealth monitor should have shown outperformance for most clients but actually 85% of portfolios that we review were underperforming the benchmark right and on this 50000 crores alone the missed gains is close to 2000 crores so had these investors not invested in these funds but invested better they would have had 2000 crores more worth of assets right so uh, uh, solving for this core mutual fund part of the portfolio was something important uh, our flagship strategy which we now call equity revival uh solved for this using a data driven so there again the investment uh platform the process the team that all required a build out so a lot of our tech also that we built along the way was very i'd say inward looking or not customer facing but that was an important uh, requirement to be able to deliver a great uh, portfolio outcome and therefore an experience so i think along both of these sides we have seen like progress being made 
uh, on the overall assets under management today will be around 6 or 1000 crores uh, what is most satisfying is that somebody who starts off with 100 rupees with us at the beginning of the year by the end of the year they've added another 75 to 100 rupees further on top of it uh, which for us is uh, sort of a feeling of the fact that people are placing trust with us having come into uh, the deserve umbrella they are willing to give us more of their portfolio which is uh, what i think our business requires also no and those numbers look very strong and the growth everything points to the fact that there is strong customer pull tell me qualitatively in early days when you started to feel there is product market fit this is working what did it feel like and what did it softly feel like that you said chalo ab isko scale karte so uh and you know this whole concept of product market fit has been sort of uh, uh very troublesome because uh, you never really truly know i feel that you have it or even if you feel like you have it you're constantly worried about losing it right so uh, i think what for me gave us the biggest insights around this was the fact that when people would call up on their own and say that okay i have a few lakhs or 25 30 lakhs more to give you uh, without us reaching out to them right because that means that what has happened at the customers end or the clients end one they've got more money the one of the first few names that came to their mind uh, for parking this money was deserve and after that they took the trouble to reach out to our team or uh, go into the platform and add more money because it's not something that happens automatically it's an active action that a customer needs to take and we all know how active actions require i mean there's a lot of friction life takes over and suddenly you forget about it so the fact that people were thinking of us and coming back on their own to top up was the first indicator for me that okay we are on to something here and we should now double down and improve those journeys uh i think i still feel that all of us need to as as deserve we speak to a lot of customers and we keep doing that and we try to understand that what is it that brought them to us so now for the in the last few months we've been seeing that they heard about deserve from one of their friends who was a client or sometimes not a client because they didn't have enough money to deal with us but pointed the friend to us right so some of those things are now beginning to uh, prove to me that there is a uh, product market fit if you look at purely from a numbers perspective right our business wealth management has acquisition retention and repeat right and typically when you look at other businesses consumer tech you focus on the acquisition part but when it comes to wealth management retention and repeat are actually the more important data points if any of these are broken acquisition will break at some point of time so given that we see very strong trends in retention and repeat uh, we feel that now we have strong pmf that we can build on top of so i think spot on even internally as i reflect back on you know companies you meet at a series a b stage for us more often than not like of course in the financial services wealth space even broadly retention and repeat start to become the best indicator to say will this company do well and if that's going then the other parts of the flywheel start to work and you feel own. like this happens was with a lot of other businesses also that it is uh, something that most founders should keep in mind 100% because i feel that's the strongest sign that your product is working uh once your product is working even if it is for a small set of users you have on board today you can find ways to get to other users like that might be an iterative process uh, you'll have to get to the right numbers etc but this is almost a necessary condition right like if your retention repeats are not there you're throwing people on top of the funnel and um, people are not sticking around then pretty much for any business whether it's a b2b b2c i feel it's the strongest sign to say something's not working let's go back to the drawing board interesting makes sense i think one of the other things sandeep when you were speaking about pmf was this whole idea of being a uh, everything is a spectrum right like you can never be a purist about anything uh, and here i wanted to bring in a little bit of what we do in tech product uh, data side um, of course the vision was to say we want to be a digital first uh, player 
but it's an evolution in that journey. And I think this being a purist or like doing things which don't scale, however you sort of put this, is always a question people debate to say, uh, you know, I can't get to the perfect thing, but can I launch? Can I do something? How has that journey played out? Maybe use your tech product journey as a underlying theme, but also then talk about uh, sometimes how perfection is an enemy of uh, action. So, uh, Vas, I think at the very first thing, we are a wealth management company, right? We manage people's money and everything that we do is in service of that goal, right? So, the point I'm making is that tech or product or the investment solutions are all areas that we work on to be able to become a large wealth management company that is trusted by a lot of affluent Indians, right? And therefore, everything like the so we can't say that we want to be a tech first company. That's more like what is a culture of the company, the ethos, the way we operate. But from a customer perspective, we can't force them to do things which are not native to them at any point of time. So, uh, for example, when we think about our tech uh, also, there are two parts of it. One is the customer facing tech which uh, we ended up using, let's say, WhatsApp in a very big way, right? And why did we do that? Because that's a platform that's very native to the user. The user wants to talk to us on WhatsApp. And if I force them to engage with us in any other way, that will be a disappointing experience for the user, right? So the customer side was very, uh, uh, it, we didn't approach it from a tech first perspective, but more from a customer first perspective and then using tech to solve for that. The second thing, and that's where majority of our investment has and continues to go into, is what I call the capability stack, right? The capability stack is, for example, how we onboard a customer, uh, how we uh, take their money transferred from their account to uh, our portfolios. How does the e actual execution of the portfolio happen after that? And our industry had not invested in building a strong tech-led capability stack. As a result of which what has happened is that every wealth manager tends to cap out at a few thousand clients because the number of uh, people that you need in the operations and support functions tends to grow very large, which becomes a limiting factor to your ability to serve more people, right? So from our perspective, a lot of the tech investments went into building this capability stack, which are not very obvious to the outside world and don't need to be also. Uh, and that's now really helping us. For example, today we are able to do about seven to 8,000 trades within 20 working days of a month on the back of a six member team. Uh, why is this uh, such a big thing? Because not only does that translate to leverage for the business and therefore me being able to offer more cost efficient solutions to clients, but also the fact that error rates are next to negligible because all of this is being run on a technology first platform, right? So I think most of the tech investments were from a first principles perspective that what will this really do to the business? And I'm not building a new shiny toy, which might not have real impact uh, uh, to the customer or to the business. Uh, and I think here is where like a lot of credit goes to the senior leadership, uh, the product uh, leadership, the engineering leadership, that they also think like that. In fact, they sort of force me to uh, ensure that I am also not chasing a new shiny toy. Uh, for example, there's a lot of talk about AI in our ecosystem, right? At this point, the question we need to ask us is that which are the areas that AI will help us? Uh, do I really need to expose it to clients? Maybe not. Maybe a lot of that use cases are internal to the company, right? And may go to efficiency and better outcomes for clients. So I think some of that uh, sort of intellectual honesty on the part of the leadership team, I think has really uh, helped. And I think that's a good segue to start speaking about the team. I think one of the things we have done really well is to bring together that bench of leadership. What have been some learnings there in putting together that team? So uh, one of the things, and I think this came out of the discussions that we've been having within the board also, is that 
we should always get leadership which is a few notches above the current state of business right and i think uh, just that uh, thought process has really helped uh, the company in a very big way so at every stage of the company we had very senior leaders join to run what at that time was a much smaller uh, business right uh, so over investing in leadership talent i think was very very uh, critical i think it our job was a little easier because the kind of space that we are in the pain is felt by these folks with their own portfolios very right? relatable it's very relatable and i think honestly that makes the founders job much much easier when you try and bring on uh, talent right the second uh, part of that is that we as founders also need to accept the fact or actually uh, enjoy the fact that we have senior leaders in the company who will have independent opinions and who will challenge uh, your own thought process and i think that's a very refreshing thing especially coming from the world where i come from in financial services which are naturally top down for various reasons right uh, so i think that was the uh, second part and the third was that the leadership needs to uh, align onto a similar vision and get along with each other really well because if that happens uh, the teams below work very efficiently together uh, where problems happen with teams below is actually a representative of the fact that the leadership is not uh, aligned and that's one thing where in the uh, when we have whenever we bring on a leader that leader is met with and interviewed by almost every other leader in the company so that going in uh, the existing uh, leadership team is thumping the table and saying that we do want this person in the company leading this particular division so they are sort of backing their success in the future so i think these broad three things have really helped uh, us over the years so this years. takes time and i almost am going to force you to put a number if you think of early days what percentage of your time were you hiring uh i think always be hiring honestly i i personally my time i think 70 to 80% of the time then and now still goes into hiring if i have free time i would like to spend it with either our current team or the people that we are bringing on because in a sense uh, i think of deserve as a as a fortress where you have to be very careful of whom you let in right uh, and uh, uh, the moment you like make a mistake on that uh you need to also correct it and we are not very good at asking people to go right and therefore we become that much harder on ourselves when we bring somebody in we like sometimes our recruitment processes are like we try to do it fast but they end up uh, involving seven to eight interactions sometimes the board will also meet some of the senior candidates etc uh and that just takes so much time there are times when the uh, candidate has asked me that i am aligned you are aligned why do we need to do all of this and that also in a sense is a red flag for me right because i do want candidates to appreciate the fact that this is a collective uh, process and not a one to one kind of an arrangement so it does slow us down and in some cases uh, we will miss out on potentially the best uh, iq talent but uh, in the longer interest of the company it's good to have this kind of a process at least No, and I think that inputs like that time you mentioned shows finally in sort of the team that's come together. The other thing I've always found fascinating about a business like ours is there is almost I would think three, four, five subcultures to manage. There's a tech product team, there is a client servicing, sales, RM team, there is a ops side of business, there's an investing side of business, all of which work with slightly different imperatives. Yeah. So how has that journey been? And I would think this is very typical of companies as they scale. There's always at least two to three subcultures to manage. what's been that learning i i call it the bombay versus bangalore culture so uh, and uh, look i think first thing is that both of these cultures need to exist for a large outcome in this business uh, and i'll what are these two cultures one is the financial services culture which is more the way that you you're operating in a regulated space so you have to be very thoughtful about what you're doing check everything twice reconfirm with regulations talk to lawyers etc and the other is the consumer tech side of things which is like you want to experiment fast etc and both of these are therefore uh, sort of pulling at each other in very different directions right and i think in the initial phase i did not 
appreciate how tough this will be uh, it almost seemed like uh, we'll get by uh, but over the last couple of years this became very clear that we will have to structurally solve for it and that uh, happened because of the leadership team now is aligned with each other they know that so why is a compliance or head of compliance pushing back on a certain release versus head of product asking for that release is very clear to each other right so at least there is appreciation of the other person's point of view uh, and once that appreciation is there then you are in a problem solving situation versus being in a situation where you are combative with each other so i think that took some time uh, getting uh, every leader to appreciate the other person's point of view i think was the solve for us and if the leadership like i said started aligning then the teams also started uh, aligning over time because uh, and now what happens is sometimes the product team will think about compliance and legal aspects before uh, they will come to the compliance team and the compliance team will think about growth uh, uh, challenges uh, and before they give their feedback to the product team so i think now it's a healthy balance and this problem also sort of is in different parts like investments and uh, uh, you know the growth teams uh, so the investment team will not allow the growth team to launch a solution which they don't have conviction in and i think that's a great place to be in similarly now the growth team thinks about is the investment team aligned do they have a structure about managing this money so i think it's gotten much better over time but honestly any company in this space will have this challenge and should too in traditional financial services this challenge has been sales versus uh internal uh, investment team so it's always been there in our case it manifests differently no and it's very real i think to what you're saying if there is broader mission alignment and there is understanding it all works and it's beautiful when this orchestra plays out what did you tactically do in early days to just get everybody to see each other's points of view what worked uh so what would happen is that uh let's say leader x and leader y are not seeing eye to eye leader x would talk to me and leader y would talk to me what i normally do is put everyone in the same room and almost air each other's grievances myself like i would say that okay leader x has these challenges leader y has these challenges sometimes it's a little embarrassing for them because they've not said that to each other but once that openness and transparency happens uh and then they are able to see the problem and not the personality it becomes much easier now the point is that i think we've got into a point of much higher degree of transparency and candor within the company where people say things when they disagree uh, fairly directly uh i'm trying to encourage this whole process of questioning also so we have let's say weekly review calls on different mandates uh every once in a while there'll be one leader who would play the devil's advocate that why are we doing this what will it achieve etc and some of that like transparency questioning candor really helps i feel uh, and at the end of the day we go for a drink and then everything is fine so very helpful um awesome sandeep last uh, few minutes i want to spend uh, how did you think about getting that first set of users and especially given this is a trust business uh, that's there's always that challenge you need to surmount in early days yeah so uh, wealth management suffers from a huge cold start problem uh, because you're essentially asking people to trust you with their money and especially as a young company that's always a, a challenge i in their position and the client's position i would also think twice before giving money to a new in a uh, player now uh, so there were two parts uh, of or two types of customers or clients one is what i call known to us which were people that to some extent were aware about uh, the three of us or the rest of the team and uh, even though they may not have invested with us in the uh, past roles but they were familiar with uh, deserve or the concept that we are trying to build and about our own backgrounds etc so ensuring that we started off or seeded the product with these folks was very important so we almost made a list of all the like and one of the things that doesn't scale like all the friends that we knew in this category who would have enough money and figure out a way to reach out to them and so on so that was the one part of it which is the known to us uh, 
the second was a new to us uh, which is people whom we don't know and they don't know us right and they're building some awareness about uh, deserve and all of us was very very important you will never give money to somebody who you've not interacted with or seen for at least a few times and there we invested heavily into building uh, brands on linkedin uh, to the point that we a lot of us people tell us that we are omnipresent on linkedin that whenever they open linkedin they'll see a, either a deserve post or one from my handle uh, but i think that really helped us in the past because linkedin is one of those platforms which where you can uh, click into somebody's profile see their backgrounds uh, and build a little bit of trust and that was our advantage and we wanted to play to that advantage whereas other social media platforms were not offering that so if you let's say on x or twitter when you click somebody's bio you don't see their previous professional experience right so i think uh, investing in linkedin helped us get that new to us uh, 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 customers i think at some point both of these started converging where the existing customers started interacting with our linkedin content in a way that we were able to reach out to their networks and grow from there and some of these compounding loops they take time initially but when the inflection point happens they take off very very uh, rapidly uh, and i think the one thing however is to know that whenever we are uh, trying to grow on a certain platform like linkedin delivering real value to the end user um uh, or area of interest to them something that they can learn from or be better or smarter because of i think that's very very important so just investing in that and honestly that did not take that much capital also back in the day no and i think one of the things we have done well is to actively pursue multiple channels and to start building for the next channel when one channel was working and it's almost like there's a channel stage fit like there are a point of time where some channel works then you start thinking of it as the next stage just uh, expand on this a little bit because also we see a lot of businesses where in initial days you're trying some channel and you're hoping that channel gives you the next 10x and the next 10x but usually you see the need for a different channel at each stage yeah i think this is a constant uh, thought process within the company that how do we identify new niches that we can enter uh, and you know in our case was and you know this well is that uh, we are talking about assets under management and not number of uh, users right so it's less about how big that niche is in terms of number of users but how big that niche is in terms of assets under management so that is the one lens that we apply to when we try and identify new channels to reach out to these uh, niches uh, the second thing is that even among channels there are certain channels that you know going in will be the more tougher or more expensive ones to do and as we got to the mid stage of the company let's say about a year year and a half into the journey we started saying that let's tackle the tougher ones first before we tackle the easier ones mm -hmm. for example uh, going offline is a relatively easier channel for us we know that uh, business uh, we understand that uh, and working with partnerships etc would have potentially got us much cheaper access to clients than let's say digital would have got but we invested on digital so that we get start building an iterative process to continue reducing cost of uh, acquisition on that particular side now that we are seeing that work out we are saying okay now let's try and figure out to go to more scalable offline options uh, etc so yeah i think one is that figuring out that multiple channels uh the niches that you will go to and within those also trying to attack the tougher problems uh when you feel that the company has the right muscle to be able to deal with those tougher problem so in the early days we did organic stuff like linkedin etc then we went to digital marketing now that that is uh, working really well we want to start focusing on the offline and partnerships and other areas okay super so sandeep always be hiring always be speaking to the customers always be finding the next new channel it looks like you're always on to multiple things as a founder um as you reflect back on this last 3 years out of journey um what's been some of the biggest learnings what do you wish you had known when you had started what would you want to tell very early stage founders today 
oh lots of uh, things and i think that will call for its own uh, podcast in the kind of mistakes that uh, we have made uh, like you know I, and i know that like going back to campus when i was studying at iim bangalore organizational behavior was not one of my favorite courses right we think about more tactical or finance and strategy and marketing and stuff like that but now i've begun to appreciate the fact that culture uh, is probably the most important because every business is about the people running it uh, and all of the things like clients and the technology and uh, investors and fundraising will all get solved as a result of that one thing so i think focusing very uh, and being very thoughtful about the kind of people you want what is the culture that you're trying to build and i know it sounds like a little a lot of english and a lot of like uh, Uh, vague stuff, but just putting down what are the ideal characteristics of people that you want to, uh, who I mean, who who you want to hire or deserve. I'll give you an example. Fundamentally, we believe we are in a services business, right? We we have to be we serve at the pleasure of our client. If they are happy with us, we will do well and we will be happy, right? and that requires an always on mindset which essentially means that uh, if there's a customer issue or if there's a challenge that any user is facing uh, the speed with which we respond to it the uh, so for example our teams work through weekends because our customers are most free on weekends when it comes to their portfolios otherwise they are uh, bogged down with work or family lives etc so just and that then requires a certain type of people who will be uh, accepting of the fact that we will have to be alert on weekends uh, and deliver the service that we have to so i think this sort of cultural ethos that uh, and focusing on that and building that i think has been uh, the biggest learning for me and going back in time i would do this much earlier in the uh, journey would have helped us not uh make some of the mistakes that we did so sometimes instead of prioritizing like uh just sheer talent this service orientation or the fact that are you comfortable being available at all points of time whenever there's a customer issue is actually more important than getting the best person for that particular job if they don't align with this if they don't align with this then it doesn't work for our business it no, makes sense and see one of the other things i've seen is founders almost need to learn and grow every 6 months like there's a new set of skills you need to pick up we spoke a little bit about channel stage fit i think there's also founder skill stage fit uh how's that sort of journey been for you what have you done to consciously say what does the company need me to do for the next phase of the journey and actively start building that for yourself no i think uh, and this among the three of us uh, co-founders has been a big debate as to whether we are stepping up as the company is scaling i think one thing that keeps us on our toes is that in general our team is smarter than we are so uh, they always like i always feel that am i able to add value to them and if not then i need to go back to the drawing board think harder read more uh, be more aware etc so i think that's one part what's really helped me is conversations with other founders and these are not like those casual conversation but three or four founders with whom let's say i have built a strong relationship so that i keep going back and every few months uh, we catch up uh, where uh, over drinks or over a meal where we would talk about like what are they facing in their own and they would ask me and so on and now that's become like that ritual which helps me like i feel like because some of, most of them are companies larger than us uh, i feel like these are the problems that we will come up on and if i can work uh, today to stay ahead of that uh, for me getting coaching has been important uh, which has been helping uh, i think that allows us to or me to you know be more dispassionate about the decisions that i'm making because in the thick of action you sometimes react emotionally whereas a good coach uh, asks you to take a step back uh, list down things what are the challenges pros cons things like that in and in the process sort of calm you down to the point where you are taking a much more thoughtful rational decision as opposed to a hasty emotional decision so i think uh, uh, relationships with other founders and with uh, uh, my coach has really helped 
Oh, very helpful, Sandeep. And I think we alluded to this right at the beginning is building in financial services, the bar on governance, compliance, uh, etc. is extremely high. Uh, how do you sort of build this culture in from day one? Yeah, I think uh, the one, uh, okay, let's say that everyone in the company is broadly aligned to the success of the company, right? Expressing to them that any regulatory violation will be uh, a challenge uh, for the company and is detrimental to the overall vision and mission. I think that has really helped us. And I think Webhav, uh, who also leads our compliance uh, function, uh, has been also expressing this very repeatedly within the company and that's sort of sunk in. Uh, so Kavita, who uh, looks after our legal compliance, I think every time there's a new SEBI discussion paper also, she breaks it down in a way that the, everyone in the company understands it, puts it down on our Slack channel so that people ask questions around that. I think some of that appreciation of the fact that we have to embrace the regulatory uh, uh, you know, uh, agencies as partners, as opposed to thinking of them as somebody who is like a a uh, tough school teacher, uh, I think that mindset makes a big difference. So Sandeep, almost every Sunday evening it's become a ritual for me to see an email from Sandeep Jaitwani pop up on my inbox or when I go to, yeah. yes, and uh, also to go onto LinkedIn and see a post from you or the team. See, there are many businesses which benefit from personal branding, right? Of course, wealth is one, but many B2B businesses, B2C businesses which are built on trust, um, so what's been that journey for you to build a personal brand? And for some, it comes naturally. For some, it's usually a little bit of push is needed. So what's uh, what's your journey? So Vas, I think the, it comes from the consumer insight that in cer certain businesses or industries, people trust people before they trust a new brand. For example, if you look at healthcare, you trust a doctor more than the clinic or the hospital that they're operating at. Uh, and very similar in wealth management also that... Uh, people would trust an individual with an experience before they trust a relatively young brand. Now, if you if we realize that, then as somebody who is invested in the success of the company, it's natural that for we have to embrace this particular uh, process, that we have to put ourselves out there, talk about what we are doing, our own background, uh, and what the company is uh, working on and so on. So I think uh, just embracing the fact that this is a part of the job uh, and it comes uh, with the job description, I think is was very helpful for me. The one mistake, however, that I made in the early days is I would sort of micromanage a lot of or almost all of the releases that would happen, whether it's the video content uh, or the LinkedIn post that would go out from my side or the newsletter. And over time, there was a point came that where the team did an intervention and said that Sandeep, this is not going to scale because you don't have the time and everything is getting pushed back. You lay out the principles of what uh, we should do or not do. And so long as we are within those principles, uh, we will release that piece of content. The moment that started happening, it went to consistency. Uh, and consistency in any personal brand building or any brand building for that matter is very important. You can't do something sporadic and then drop off and then come back again and expect it to deliver results. You have to just keep at it over a period of time. So I think uh, just embracing that, letting go a little bit uh, and uh, you know ensuring that is being done consistently is important. From a personal mindset perspective, you know, in the era of, I mean, social media where trolling is a reality, etc., you also have to sort of develop a thick skin, which is one area where I'd say I'm a work in progress, right? Where i am not gotten to a point where I will not care about what somebody else is right about uh, the podcast that we put out, etc. I would still think about it. Could I have done it better? The team still believes that we should just do what we are doing and ignore some of the ultra negative stuff. But I think it's a process. Very fair. And you guys have done a phenomenal job. Uh, we keep taking little pages out of your book. So... So you guys are doing a fantastic job too. So yeah. Awesome. And Sandeep, when you look at the next two, three, five years, what feel like uh, big priorities, big milestones? So uh, on the business side, any number that I lay out, Vast will seem 
uh, very small in the context of the space that we are in. Like I said, we are looking at a country where there'll be 1.6 uh, million dollar millionaires, potentially three times of that in terms of half a dollar, half a millionaire, and so on, right? So the number of uh, you know wealth creators in India is only increasing. The second is that even the assets under management will go to in the range of two to two and a half trillion dollars. In India, formal wealth managers manage sub 10% of the uh, wealth management pool. Rest of it is very informally managed, etc. So even on the assets under management metric, there's a long way to uh, go. If you look at the current annual revenue pool of our industries in the range of six to seven billion dollars. Uh, so even that is very large. So all of these are such large numbers that for me to put out any number will seem like a very small outcome, right? And therefore, I think the one thing that we should focus on is that am I becoming uh, the most trusted financial services brand for the affluent Indian? Uh, and that for us is truly the vision because not only does that require us to live a journey on a daily basis in a certain way, so it makes sure that we are taking the tough decisions right up front. It also makes sure that the company is built as a platform for a lot of other potential opportunities in the future. If you build a trusted brand, what you can do with it is significantly more than what if you were only doing things tactically. I mean, look at Tata, for example, like today, whether they are in the automotive space or in the healthcare space or in the retail space, they can launch a product in every particular category and get enough traction early on. Why is that? Because they are a trusted brand, right? And I think we need something like that for the affluent Indian in the financial services space. So at the very highest level, that's the big vision. But uh, in terms of the space that we are in, I think just the tailwinds are so strong. There is $2 billion of monthly SIP flows coming into the markets. There are 40 million mutual fund customers in India. Mutual fund AUM just crossed 50 lakh crores. So just the tailwinds are so strong and sharp that we just have to keep doing our work on a daily basis. So 100%. And I thought this would be my last question, but you gave me an opening. So I thought I'll ask you one more. Is, you know, a lot of people talk about building the right brand and that's always an aspiration when you start a company. You know, brand's not just about the brand marketing spend on your line item. It's a lot more about the customer touch points, etc. Mm -hmm. So define to us in terms of when you say brand building, what does it mean? What do we do day to day to make our brand successful? Of course, you spend a little bit, but beyond that, what do you do? I think, the I think the spending is the least of it, honestly, uh, Vas. Uh, and like I explained to you earlier that in our business, acquisition, retention, repeat, retention, repeat are the more important things which is essentially about the engagement that I'm having with existing clients of Deserve, right? Now, for us, what does that mean? Every time we're making a portfolio action, we ought to explain it to our customers, okay? Why is that very important? Because our clients are smart people. They, they've done really well in their lives. And if explained what is happening in their portfolio, they will probably trust us more, right? Uh, at what frequency do their portfolio reports go to them? Are the portfolio reports in a way that they can understand uh, them? Are my fee structures aligned? For example, we operate on, uh, for majority of our portfolio, on no, a zero fixed fee and only a share of profit. That's again a costly brand investment because I am absorbing the variability of the market in a way so that my clients can align with me much more, right? So those are actually the tough decisions which brands are built on top of and less on the brand marketing spends. In fact, for the last few quarters, our brand marketing spends have been extra negligible because all of the brand efforts are going into this part of uh, things. So like, for example, one of the common perceptions in our uh, business is that we have to quote unquote dumb down things for clients to understand. That's not true. I think uh, we need to explain it uh, give enough context, give enough data and people get it, right? If I dump it down, I will probably miss communicate some parts and in the process, uh, you know, break the trust. So these are some of the day-to-day -day decisions that actually cause a brand to get built. Oh, super. I think that's a great place to end this, but thank you so much, Sandeep. Always a pleasure. Thanks, Vas. Really enjoyed this conversation. 